This program contains mature images and discussion. Viewer discretion is advised. Okay, thank you for inviting me here to talk with you a little bit about my work and sort of general work around social computing. Um, so we're going to focus today on content moderation. And, you know, but before we get into where we're at today, let's take a look at the history and the development of content moderation, which takes us back to the early 90s. Um, so back in the early 90s, one popular social space online were the CompuServe forums. But in 1990, one user posted defamatory content about another, saying that basically someone was fired from his previous job and that his current project was a scam. So the targeted user actually brought CompuServe itself to court, arguing that they were liable for those statements made by their users. CompuServe, on the other hand, argued that they acted as a distributor and not as a publisher of the content. That is, they were just pushing out the content without any kind of editorial review, and a 1991 court agreed that, you know, because of this, they should not be held responsible. However, just a few years later, a user of one of Prodigy's message boards claimed that an investment banking firm and its president committed fraud um, and other criminal activities, and Prodigy was similarly, uh, similarly brought to court. Um, but in this case, because Prodigy actively deleted some posts, it was considered liable for all of the content that it hosted. So essentially, no moderation means no liability, but any moderation means sudden liability for all of this content. So this created a strong disincentive for online intermediaries to moderate the content that users posted. As a result, Congress passed the Communications Decency Act, where Section 230 specifically addressed providers of online content. And among other things, Section 230 stated that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So the goal here was to incentivize and protect intermediaries Good Samaritan blocking of offensive material. In following cases, courts established that it kind of went even further than this though. So the courts established that faced with potential liability for each message, services might, you know, for each message republished by their services, service providers might choose to severely restrict the number and type of messages posted and found that Section 230 was intended to provide, you know, protect providers from the threat that lawsuits um, pose to the freedom of speech in the new and burgeoning internet medium. So Section 230 kind of had these twofold goals, like one, um, encourage services to make good Samaritan efforts to remove offensive material, while at the same time promoting free speech protections for users. So what this does is it puts platforms in a position where they're trying to decide what counts as offensive or toxic material. So basically kind of like the platforms are the only ones who are responsible for this decision. And it turns out this is a really difficult problem. So let's talk through a handful of examples. And I wanna be really clear in advance that you won't necessarily agree with all of the examples. In fact, you probably won't, but I think they do a good job of kind of exploring um, these various conflicts. So let's start with nudity. Many platforms have policies like this one from Instagram that prohibit nudity and or sexual images on their platforms. However, some users do not agree with these policies. For example, artists like Betty Tompkins use Instagram to showcase their professional work. But despite being a renowned artist, Instagram has deleted more than a dozen posts featuring her artwork. And in April of 2019, when she posted a photo from a catalog featuring a photorealistic explicit painting, Instagram actually deactivated her account. Tompkins said in a statement that because of Instagram's major role in the art world, its current guidelines are prohibitive to artists whose work is challenging or thought-provoking. As another example, 
Since LGBTQ identities have often been stigmatized, the internet has been pivotal in helping those with diverse gender and sexual identities learn about themselves and find each other. For example, prior to 2019, Tumblr was a popular queer ecosystem, um, which is defined in the Cho chapter that I'm reading from, where, quote, users circulate porn, flirt, provide support to deal with homophobia, as well as advice on coming out, and so on. But after the nudity policy was updated, this ecosystem was decimated with visits to the login page dropping by 50%. As another example, most platforms have policies like this one from Facebook that prohibit hate speech or toxic content. But what about a community of people who were reclaiming a hate speech term as the LGBTQ community has done with the term queer? Or what about a community of people who have used terms within their community offline for decades, but are forced to change how they speak online because of how others might use those same terms? Another example is policies on misinformation. So Twitter is actually one of the platforms with the most permissive policy on allowing misinformation. So their misinformation policies are pretty narrowly defined and, and focused around COVID-19 and civic integrity. And they require the content be likely to lead to harm in order to be taken down. Nevertheless, some disagree with these takedowns. For example, Twitter permanently suspended an account of a US representative from Georgia, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Green herself disagreed with the decision, releasing a statement that social media platforms can't stop the truth, big tech can't stop the truth. But there are also broader concerns around technology companies intervening in which political, political actors have access to the public. Or let's look at violence. Again, most platforms have policies that restrict violent or graphic deaths or accidents or show real world violence. But as, one, as a participant in one of our recent studies noted, videos that do in fact contain violent and disturbing content um, can be very important. As he said, most of us would have known nothing about George Floyd had those social media platforms been censoring. And, and while platforms often do have exceptions for newsworthiness, marginalized communities are not necessarily in the room as platforms are deciding what is newsworthy or not. In fact, precisely because marginalized communities may lack other forms of power and access, the ability to make full use of social media becomes incredibly important. So hopefully what these examples have begun to convey is that these policies play an incredibly important role in governing people and behavior in a giant segment of their lives. But people often disagree with these policies. And sometimes this is related to specific contexts or specific communities, but it often exposes a fundamental difference in values. For example, a tension between safety and security and freedom and exploration. And as people spend more and more time online, some see it as an increasing issue that platforms govern in this unilateral way. So, okay, I think that gives us a sense of the broader picture. So let's take a minute um, to talk about how content moderation actually operates. So imagine someone, in this example, an employee at the San Diego Museum of Art makes a post. This post could be flagged for, this post could be flagged by any of their followers for a number of possible policy violations, including those we just talked about, as well as things like intellectual property violations. Or it might be flagged by an automated moderator that's been trained to identify the same problematic content. And depending on the issue and the platform, the post might be removed altogether so that no one can see it, or it might simply be restricted so that fewer people encounter it on their newsfeed or through the search functions. And each time that this happens, most platforms treat it as a strike, or if it's a really bad piece of content, they might treat it as multiple strikes. And then at some point, if an account has accumulated too many of these strikes, they'll be suspended or banned. That said, recently many platforms have um, built systems to allow users to appeal decisions, either about individual pieces of content or about their entire account. And these appeals can be reviewed either by human moderators or, and this is increasingly common since the start of COVID, they can be reviewed by another automated system. 
And I don't think we'll really get into this deeply here, but I'll mention it quickly. Um, much of the content that vol violates these po platform policies is like really, really terrible stuff. So we're talking about beheadings, abuse of animals, stuff that is bad enough to give the human moderators PTSD. And there's a lot of great work on this topic from journalists and a book I'd recommend by Sarah Roberts. But like, for example, Facebook paid out um, an $85 million settlement this year to its human content moderators because of the psychological harm that they had suffered. So the fact that they're increasingly able to automate sections of this process you know, is probably overall a good thing. Um, but the key point here, the key point here is that this is a socio-technical system. It's not just code running alone, it's code running alongside social actors with various motivations and behaviors and so on. Um, and the code is often trained on the output or based on decisions by these human actors. And I think we're very used to hearing about issues in the automated parts of these systems. So for example, if an automated system has a blanket rule to delete any posts that use hate speech, but then when people post about being insulted using hate speech or slurs because they're looking for support about that experience, and instead the system just deletes their post. So this is an example um, of Francie Latour, who was you know, in the grocery store with her two children who were targeted by someone who, who called them racial slurs. And so you know, Francie Latour went on Facebook to vent about this experience, but within 20 minutes, Facebook deleted her post, sending her a cursory message that her content had violated company standards. So, you know, like we encounter these kinds of, of issues with the automated systems and the rules that they have kind of all the time, but, but issues can also crop up in the ways that humans interact with these systems. So, you know, often that becomes part of the training data or part of the labeling. Okay, so we've considered a number of specific problems that we've encountered with social media, as well as considering where those issues derive from, coming from poorly designed automation, but also from humans involved in creating the labeling, creating or labeling the data as well. And I wanna add just kind of one more thing to think about as, as we're kind of considering these systems, which is that platform governments, governance is often global governance. So these platforms are making decisions about how content moderation should be performed. And as we discussed earlier, this is almost entirely being driven by US frameworks and US lawyers on these company payrolls. But many countries do not provide the kind of First Amendment protections of free speech that are the norm here in the States. And many people there, you know, in different places may take issue with the fact that, for example, users of a given platform may be able to share pretty hateful, toxic content that would be restricted, you know, much more restricted under local laws. Okay, so that brings us back to where we're at today, which is you know, where we encounter these frequent persistent issues with how content moderation operates and where those might be you know, unintended failures of the system or might be a function of policy or training data, or they might you know, simply reveal a fundamental disagreement over values. So let's turn now to some of the solutions that researchers and designers have proposed. One lightweight intervention that folks have begun to explore is introducing explanations into content moderation work. So researchers have argued for some time that content moderation ought to be less punitive and more educational. For example, Sarah Myers West has argued that if the overall objective of a content moderation system is to encourage better behavior on the part of users, such a system doubly fails. Not only does it not address the need to educate users about the reason they violated a content policy, it offers them no opportunity for engagement with the platform to learn. As a result, researchers have explored providing explanations for individual posts that have faced moderation or removal, and they seem to help. For example, Javier et al. found that providing explanations reduce the likelihood of future removals. 
And some platforms have gone even further, actually pushing the explanations and interventions before users post. For example, some news sites have used systems that pre-screen comments for toxic tone or language, and then give commenters an opportunity to change their wording before they post. And you know, the hope is that using these lightweight nudges where the user is still in control, that they can, you know, reduce the overall volume of toxic contents, comments. Another approach that's been explored is allowing users representation in the content moderation process. For example, in my own work, I found a growing demand for representative moderation. That is a form of content moderation where users have a say in how policies are made uh, and how decisions are carried out. And some experimental versions of this approach exist. So Jenny Fan et al. built a tool that they call Digital Juries, which supports voting by community members on various decisions. And they actually tested out two versions of this tool, one where each person individually votes and a final score is determined by majority vote, and a second version that's actually pretty close to a real life version, real life jury, where the jurors actually talk and deliberate before making a final decision. And while there are pros and cons of the two alternatives, like you know, one of them is much easier to scale, and, and one of them you kind of have a richer decision making, they find that both are strongly preferable to the status quo. And again, platforms themselves are also experimenting with these kinds of ideas. Um, you may have seen um, Birdwatch, which recruits users to provide context to potentially misleading tweets on Twitter and seeks to provide community, community input on the trustworthiness of, of the content there. And I'll mention just one other approach that some folks have been experimenting with, which is personalization. So the idea here is, um, is that as I've alluded to earlier, people have fundamentally different opinions about what should or should not be shown on social media. For example, depending on your demographics, like your race or your age or your gender or your experiences or your opinions, you're much more or less likely to believe that a particular piece of content should be shown. So this suggests the possibility to tune classifiers to those demographic and personal preferences. Um, and as Deepak Kumar et al. have shown, and this is a quote from their work, a single definition of toxic content online does not capture the varied experiences and opinions of internet users. As such, a one-size-fits-all model for abuse detection will, not, will likely not be able to capture the toxicity preferences of all people. But instead, you can tune a classifier to capture those individual preferences. Okay, so up to now, um, I've mostly focused on fixes that researchers have proposed or built, that is like things you could add to existing systems. But I also wanna mention that there are pretty clever organic solutions that users themselves have developed. For example, some researchers have argued that most users are actually engaged in a full social media ecosystem where the social media platforms themselves, as well as their audiences, technical affordances, the behavioral norms on different platforms, all shape a milieu in which users operate. And they've found that people deal with these content moderation and other issues by engaging differently across different parts of their social media ecosystem. So as just one example, I found in my work that artists may post some kinds of content on Instagram, but may actually move their full media piece to Pornhub because they know it's somewhere that it won't be taken down. So researchers and designers are hard at work trying to figure out how to address some of the, these issues around content moderation. But circling back to the beginning of the talk, some of these issues may spring from real fundamental disagreements over values. And I think this becomes a great place to start a conversation around ethics of these systems and their operations. Mm -hmm.